One of my viewers suggested a video about weapon ownership in Canada, which is a good idea. I've made, uh, I think, two videos about that before, one about uh, some of the firearm regulations and another one about uh, knives in particular, but I haven't um, put it together in one video, and also those two are kind of old by now. They're a couple of years old. So uh, yeah, why not? I'm gonna talk about firearms first. So it seems that a lot of people are not aware of the fact that legal gun ownership does exist uh, both in Canada and in many European countries. And uh, it's pretty common here. There are plenty of hunters and recreational shooters. So there is quite a large number of legally owned firearms in Canada actually, and illegally owned ones as well because crime obviously exists. So according to the criminal code in Canada, there are three categories of firearms. There is prohibited, restricted, and non-restricted. So the prohibited are uh, most 32 and 25 caliber handguns, for whatever reason. Subcompact handguns with a barrel length of 105 millimeters, which is 4.1 inches or less. Uh, fully automatic firearms, which includes those that were fully automatic and were then, were then converted to semi-automatic. Again, not very sensical. Um, however, if there is a, a semi-automatic specific model like the uh, FNPS90, that is actually legal in Canada, even though it's very expensive. Anyway, um, firearms with a sawed-off barrel. This is another weird one because let's say you have two shotguns, identical model. One comes with a certain barrel length from the factory. The other one originally had a longer barrel and was then shortened to the same length as the other one. The one from the factory with that length is legal. The one that's been altered is prohibited. Whatever. Then also uh, some specific models, in order to some uh, firearm models are prohibited by name, essentially, or by the you know, certain features of the model. The AK-47, for example, even though there are some AK variants which are pretty similar, which are legal, like the VZ-58, for example, or the Norinco Type 81. Um, then the Frankie Spass 12, again, for whatever reason, there are plenty of shotguns that are similar to this, uh, but that I guess don't look as threatening or whatever. They are perfectly legal. FAMAS, Uzi, MP5, Thompson submachine gun, the Steyr AUG, etc. So a lot of the fun stuff. I mean, there, there's still plenty of fun firearms available here, but it's kind of odd. So there is a prohibited license that allows you to own and um, acquire prohibited firearms, but it's next to impossible to get. There are certain people in the country that have it and uh, they can uh, transfer, uh, they can pass on grandfathered prohibited firearms to family members or they can also sell them to you know, holders of prohibited licenses. But if you're a new shooter and, and you, you just want to acquire a prohibited license and you don't already have a grandfather prohibited firearm, then you're out of luck. You, there's pretty much no way to get them, as far as I know. Uh, the easiest out of these is the PAL, which is the Possession and Acquisition License. So for that one, you just need to take a safety course. So they, they are done on, on a weekend, and it consists of a written and a practical exam, which are really not that hard. I mean, if you are prepared, it's not a big deal. You don't actually have to take the course before that. You can also read up on it yourself and familiarize yourself with the regulations and the safety, uh, you know, basic safety precautions and all of that. And then you just take the exam. So the written exam has a bunch of questions about the regulations and what, what is legal, what is not, uh, how to store firearms properly according to the law and all of this. And then there's also a practical exam where you have to demonstrate safe handling. So, you know, finger off the trigger, point in a safe direction, all of this. They, they will, uh, you know, ask you to do certain things, like for example, pick up this firearm, check if it's safe, you know, check if it's unloaded and, and all of this. So uh, yeah, it's, it's not that very difficult. And uh, then you have, you have to apply for the license. So there's an application form that you have to fill out. You also have to name a couple of references, which I personally find totally overkill. So these can be spouses, friends, etc. Just 
anyone who has known you for at least uh, I think it was three years and who can attest to the fact that you're responsible, you're not crazy and uh, all of that. And uh, they may or may not be called up for an interview. Uh, for a non-restricted license, quite often they don't bother. If you're applying for a restricted license, it's pretty much guaranteed that they will call up all your references and they will then ask them questions like, is, is this person violent? And, and in this, this or that situation, how would they act? And things like that. It's, just, again, not a big deal, but it's, a, it's an unnecessary hassle as far as I'm concerned. So then they will also do a background check you know, criminal background check, and uh, we'll check if, if you have any mental issues, things of that nature, which you know, I find reasonable enough. Overall, this entire regulation of requiring, um, you know, that people know basic safety and are familiar with the, the regulations and, uh, you know, are responsible people and not mental, I find that very reasonable. Yeah, that's that's in fact how I think it should be done. I think it's a reasonable compromise. People should definitely be able to legally acquire firearms and use them for recreational purposes, sports, hunting, and all of that. Uh, at the same time, you know, I also understand that some folks do have concerns about public safety and all of that. Uh, so it's it's a reasonable compromise because it's this is not that big of a deal, really. Uh, with a restricted one, it gets a bit more over the top, in my opinion. So what's a restricted firearm? It's any semi-automatic firearm with a barrel length of less than 470 millimeters, which is 18 and a half inches, or that can be fired when folded to a length of 660 millimeters or less. So, so for the most part, that's handguns, with a few exceptions. Also, the AR-15 has been designated restricted for just arbitrary reasons, just because it looks mean or whatever, I, I don't know. Also, revolver carbines like this are apparently restricted as well, even though they fall well above the required barrel length for a non-restricted, but apparently in this case it's just because they have a revolving action. Yeah, whatever. Okay, so the difference here is the restricted firearm is more strict with regards to transportation, and storage. You can legally transport a restricted firearm only from your home to an official shooting range or a gunsmith and back, or if you're moving, of course, obviously, but you're not allowed to, for example, come from the shooting range and, you know, stop to go see a movie or something like that. And if that happens and you have the restricted firearms in your car and they get stolen, you're in major trouble things like that. Whereas with a non-restricted firearm, you can take them out in the woods somewhere and it is actually legal to shoot those out in, you know, far enough away from highways and uh, houses, things like that. Uh, you have to make sure that you're safe, of course. You have to know where they're going. You have to have a good backstop and all of this. It also can't be within city limits, but yeah, it is absolutely legal with a non-restricted firearm, not with a restricted. <laughs> not that that makes any practical difference, really, but for the law, it does make a difference somehow. There are a few more regulations for restricted firearms, but I don't want to go into too much detail. So there's also antique firearms, which technically, as far as the law are concerned, are not considered firearms. So generally, that's anything made before 1898. I say generally because there are a few exceptions here and there as well. That's something like this, for example, a percussion pistol. This is an antique. It's made in 1851 and uses black powder. So this is, um, does not require a license. Anyone can buy these. Uh, there are also a few that fall under the antique category that are you know, revolvers using cartridges. But um, yeah, so this, ironically, if I had a reproduction of this exact model that looks the same, functions the same, is the same in every way, but is a modern reproduction, it would be a restricted firearm. But common sense? Are you crazy? That would obstruct the workings of the bureaucracy. We can't have that now, can we? There are a few other gun-related items that are also prohibited, like incendiary and flechette ammunition and suppressors. Also, there is a magazine capacity limit. Uh, the legal limit for semi-automatic rifles and shotguns is five rounds for 
everything else like bolt action or lever actions things like that it's unlimited as, as much as fits and for handguns the limit is 10 rounds that also applies to carbines that use pistol magazines so at least that's nice as absurdly strict as this may seem there is still a wide variety of firearms available in Canada and as I said there are plenty of legal gun owners but they most certainly are highly unreasonable and unnecessarily inconvenient regulations that I would very much like to see changed okay so on to non-firearms so there's also a list of particular items that are prohibited so I'm just going to go through this here for one, any device designed to be used for the purpose of injuring, immobilizing, or otherwise incapacitating any person by the discharge therefrom of tear gas, mace, or other gas, or any liquid spray powder or other substance that is capable of injuring, immobilizing, or otherwise incapacitating any person. So the weird thing about this is it prohibits things like CS gas and uh, self-defense sprays and all of that, but bear spray is legal or any kind of animal defense sprays you know, anti-dog spray and whatnot because those are designed to be used against animals rather than people they will have the same effect on a person but yeah that's what the law says second any instrument or device commonly known as nunchaku being hard non-flexible sticks clubs pipes or rods linked by a length or lengths of rope, cord, wire, or chain, and any similar instrument or device. It's very easy to demonstrate how absurdly useless this prohibition is by grabbing three items. Two wrenches, perfectly legal. One carabiner or any similar item, perfectly legal. Combining them. And now you've got nunchakos. They even work the exact same way. I'm not good with them, but it's just you can see how silly this is. You know, very, very easy to make anything like this yourself. And done. Just regular legal items now. Okay, so, and obviously anyone can take a few sticks and connect them with rope or chain or what have you. So I, I've never understood this. It's completely pointless and silly and all of that. Anyway, any instrument or device commonly known as shuriken. Uh, I've, I've made a video about that before. I'm just going to link that, so whatever. Any instrument or device commonly known as manriki gusari or kusari being hexagonal or other geometrically shaped hard weights or hand grips linked by a length or lengths of rope, cord, wire or chain and any similar instrument or device. Yeah, again, it's 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 a chain with some stuff attached. It's really, really simple. And I, I'm not aware of like rampant mall ninjas going around assassinating people, strangling with them with Manriki Kusaris. Or, it, it, really? Anyway, okay. Uh, yeah, the finger ring with blades or sharp objects. Uh, I've, I've talked about that in another video before. Any device that's designed to be capable of injuring, immobilizing, blah, 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 by discharging an electrical charge produced by means of the amplification or accumulation of the electrical current generated by a battery. Don't you love legalese? Um, yeah, so as again, length specification here when the device is at a length of less than 480 millimeters so for some reason canadian lawmakers are obsessed with length so in short stun guns and i think tasers were also mentioned elsewhere as prohibited then a crossbow or similar device that is designed or altered to be aimed and fired by the action of one hand whether or not it has been redesigned or blah blah blah, blah whatever uh, or has a length not exceeding 500 millimeters so one-handed short crossbows are prohibited other crossbows are fine if they are long enough and they require two hands to be used which is so arbitrary again canadian lawmakers and length there's something going on here and they're afraid of anything that's too short <laughs> so um i was actually interested in one of the crossbows that uh, taught this stuff this one here really interesting called the balestrino and uh, it's it's super compact it's really more of a aristocratic play thing than a serious weapon but it's interesting i would have liked to try it out but this 
throws a monkey wrench in that because it's too short and can be shot with one hand. Not good. Okay, the device known as the Constant Companion, being a belt containing a blade capable of being withdrawn from the belt, with the buckle of the belt forming a handle for the blade and any similar device. So again, the running theme here is any kind of weapon that is short enough to be concealed or designed to be concealed, things like that. Um, yeah, push daggers, I've mentioned that before that kind of thing. Uh, any device having a length of less than 30 centimeters and resembling an innocuous object but designed to conceal a knife or blade including the device commonly known as the knife comb being a comb with the handle of the comb forming a handle for the knife and any similar device. So sword canes are fine. They are long enough but you know comb knives and things like that. Not so much. Here it gets really ridiculous. The device commonly known as a spiked wristband. <laughs> Being a wristband to which a spike or blade is affixed in any similar device. Oddly enough it says which a spike or blade is affixed. So just one spike. So from what I've read apparently for a time uh, students bringing spiked wristbands to school and beating up other students was a thing and then they implemented this it's it's been a while ago since that but it's uh, i'm not actually sure how far this is enforced and how extensive the prohibition really is like is it really just a regular ass fashion wristband that happens to have spikes that is bad i'm pretty sure i've seen those for sale in canada so i'm not sure how just how specific that is and whatnot but yeah, either way, it's not that big of a deal. So yeah, the device commonly known as a Yakua blowgun, being a tube or pipe designed for the purpose of shooting arrows or darts by breath and any similar device. I've talked about that again. A blowgun is really not dangerous, especially, I mean, it's potentially dangerous, but it's not lethal. And if, if they are used with poison tipped darts, that's a different story, but then the poison is, should be prohibited, not the thing, right? Uh, okay. So the device commonly known as a Kyoga baton or steel cobra and any similar device consisting of a manually triggered telescoping spring-loaded steel whip terminated in a heavy caliber striking tip. It's just, it's fun to just read this stuff because the way it's formulated, some of this sounds like the lyrics of, of a metal album, but a lot of it is just legalese. It's, it's got this really this way of making everything sound super awkward and, and overly pompous and just kind of weird. So this has led some people to believe that telescoping batons are prohibited across the board in Canada, which they are not. If you have one that's extended by just whipping it out, it's fine. This is what this is about is any kind of baton that's, as I said, spring-loaded and at the push of a button or anything like that, you open it up, it shoots out. If, if you just have to extend it, manually then that's fine again pretty arbitrary now this is my favorite the device commonly known as a morning star and any similar device consisting of a ball of metal or other heavy material studded with spikes and connected to a handle by a length of chain rope or other flexible material from what i've read in australia even maces are banned canada has a thing with flails for some reason but not any flail, it has to be studded with spikes. So this is perfectly legal in Canada. Uh, apparently that is so that fishing weights, for example, don't end up being classified as prohibited weapons. So yeah, this is okay. And finally, brass knuckles, which I've talked about before. So it's defined as a band of metal with finger holds. And if you have a knuckle duster made of plastic, wood, stone, etc., anything but metal, that's legal. So, yeah. Lots of weird things, lots of silliness. I mean, most countries have pretty silly laws. And uh, in fact, there are a number of US states that have also banned uh, things like ballad songs, and many European countries have as well. So, it's not unusual for this stuff, like pepper spray, for example, to be prohibited. But yeah, it's, I find most of these bans just unreasonable. And at the very least, if, if you're going to prohibit this stuff, at the very least, give people the option to get a license for it. 
you know, get like a, you know, safety and self-defense course and whatever, have a background check, all of this. It, it's being done for firearms. Why can't it be done for particular knives or any of that? Well, costs more time and money, I guess that's why, but yeah, they might as well get rid of the restricted category to save time and money, but oh, whatever. I'm done now. I just wanted to talk a little bit about that, so I hope you found it interesting, and thanks for watching.